A leader in event education, the Event Leadership Institute offers on-demand video classes, interviews with industry mavericks, and online instructor-led professional development courses taught by industry experts. Visit eventleadershipinstitute.com for more information and to see a schedule of upcoming classes. Okay, are you, are you a Okay, so we're going to... Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Executive Editor Beth Kormanik. Hi, David. Hey, Beth. How are you today? Terrific, terrific. Today we're talking with the caterer Peter Callahan, who is based in New York but works on events all around the globe. Even if you haven't seen or better yet tasted his work, you've likely been to an event where someone has riffed on his ideas. He's widely credited as creating the bite-sized comfort food craze, including mini burgers, grilled cheese bites, and tiny ice cream sandwiches. Peter has a new book, The Peter Callahan's Party Food, with an introduction by fashion designer Kate Spade, and that gives you an idea of the type of clientele and friendships he's built through decades in the business. And today he's going to share some tips on how he's managed to have staying power, as well as the new directions he's exploring. David, it's always a treat for us to sit down with people who are pushing the event world forward. And in this case, it's a caterer. It's a caterer, but catering is shifting so much. Uh, to become brands and to become experiences on their own. And so they're challenged to actually be closer to their guests than anyone else because it's the most personal experience. Eating is the personalization that you can only get through food. And through live events. And live events. So would you count this as one of our Wisdom Bank episodes? I think this is a Wisdom Bank episode. Great. Well, let's take a listen. Peter, welcome to Gather Geeks. Beth, it's terrific to be here today with you and David. Yeah. Hey, Peter. Hey, David. So, Peter, your new book is called Party Food, Peter Callahan's Party Food. And so let's start off by having you define what to you is party food. Well, party food to me is things that a professional does, because I'm coming at this from a professional point of view, that's bringing original content to the world. Other professionals, home cooks. That's what party food is to me, personally. So you think it's content? Yes. That's so interesting. Yeah, I've never had it described as that, as that before, um, catering as content. So uh, so tell us where, where you get these ideas from when you are, are putting together, developing menus, new ideas, as you're coming up with your content, where are these ideas coming from? My content just sort of floats into my mind like visions. That's my best content. My clients come to me every week and basically think that creativity is on demand. They absolutely (laughs) want something that their competitor or neighbor, who can be both of those things, hasn't had before. And what have you got for me, Peter? And if I don't have something spectacular that the next whoever is fabulous hasn't had, I'm in trouble. So how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you actually create these things on demand and know that you're different and original? I mean, is it, is it, is it, is everyone original in a different way? Well, I can't speak for other people's. I can only say that when you are original, it's almost like a curse because then they're like, okay, so you're the guy with all these great ideas. So what do you have for me? Because I want the newest and the best. What's new? What's next? This is so interesting. So when a, when a client comes to you, do they know at that point what type of event they want to have? If they know it is, it's just going to be cocktails and hors d'oeuvres, or they're not sure if it's going to be a three course or a five course or or something like that. The clients that come to us are fairly sophisticated, so they typically know what they're looking for. You know, they don't necessarily know how to articulate it. They might call little tiny bite-sized hors d'oeuvres a lunch. And so when they're saying they're having a lunch, that's what they really mean. Or they'll call it a cocktail party, but it's definitely dinner. It's just not set place settings. Or then they may just come and say, I want to do a seated dinner, but I'm just so bored of a normal dinner. What do you got for me? So how do you tease that out of them? What they really, they say what they want, you know, or maybe they have the idea, but that's not what they really mean. Well, you've got to sort of, you know, it's like sitting the patient down and interviewing them. So you've got to interview them, you know, how far off the 
normal path are they looking to do? You know, is this a traditional person or company so that, you know, their idea of innovative or let's use the word experiential is sort of to the ooh-la-la cater sort of yesterday's thoughts? Or are they really reaching for that out there stuff that's also going to have impact and resonate with probably their very sophisticated attendees? Once we find that out, that's the easy part. Then, you know, the more input they have and the more just anything from them sparks ideas. And then it also, it doesn't come on demand. So I'll tell you one time, I did a party for Martha Stewart years ago. And she said in front of all her guests, she said, oh, and you had all these things that weren't even on my menu that you, that you sent me. And I'm like, that's right, but are they fabulous? And she's like, yeah. And so partly it's like, I did a party for NetJets the other day, you know, and it was down at the East Hampton airport, you know? And so all of a sudden, like literally the night before, I'm like, wait, we make things in shapes. Let's do a jet shaped cracker, you know, with caviar on it. And so we made net jet uh, hors d'oeuvres, never done it before. We happen to like, you know, have a 3D printer so we can make like that. We can make a cookie cutter. And then I torture my people with these last minute things. You know, you have to be able to do it on demand at any time that it happens because those ideas just pop in my head if they do, you know, when they do. And so it might, they didn't even know they were getting jets and it was the best thing I did for them. You know? So what is the risk though, the risk factor of the client that is getting something a little different than they ordered? How do you deal with that? I mean, other than it's fabulous usually. Yeah, it better be fabulous, David, <laughs> or you may be in hot water. You know? So that's what you're it betting on, fabulousness. Be yeah, yes. yeah. But it literally, you know, and I think it is sort of, you know, tough on my staff, but it get, the closer it gets to the event, that's when I come up with more ideas. Like there was this one time that a, with a guest, I was like, okay, so it was, you know, her Southampton dinner. I've done it for years, you know. And so when, when that's the case, you know, you, you really have a lot even more pressure. You've done this over and over, off this lot of the same people. So just literally, I was like, just sort of envisioning their dinner table there. It's beautiful, a great decorator's done it. You know, dinner's over, they've been drinking all their wine. It's been an amazing dinner. And I'm like, they're getting sleepy. These are, everyone's young. Whether you're 80 years old, you know, especially here in New York, you're young. My clients all work. They don't ever stop working. And they're invigorated, you know, and they're like, what do you got for me? And so anyways, I was like, I got to give these people shots. We're not going to ask. I'm going to bring out three shots for every guest. And we're going to put it right at 12 o'clock on the play setting. I'm going to do like, you know, a Vesper when that was more new. And I'm going to do like, you know, a Hendrix cucumber one. And everyone gets that because you're going to sleep and they want to be like hip and cool. Everyone's getting shots. Now I'm like, okay. How do you do that? Must need the big 50 people. That's 150 shots that got to come out quick. How they stay cold? By the time I pour them in the back garage, it's my kitchen, I bring them out. So I'm like, okay, we got to build trays. And this was Friday, night before. We got to build trays that have dry ice and the guests aren't going to burn themselves. And I like it to be like smoking coming out because now we're getting somewhere, right? The trays smoking. Everyone gets their little shot. Then you go to the client and you go like, this is what I'm doing. Like you show up, you don't even tell them like, I'm doing this. Everyone's getting a shot. One, two, three. Going at 12 o'clock. That's what I got for you. Thought about this at five o'clock. Told my carpenters they can't go home. They're like, whoa, how you doing, Peter? And they're like, I like it. So from a business perspective, though, these last minute inspirations, um, how does that work? How do you build that into the, the cost of the event? And when you have your carpenters up all night or you're creating something new, how does that work? That's a really good question, Beth, because, you know, if you looked at each one of these things you create and you got to be a businessman, you said, OK, the three shots and the alcohol and maybe I need another guy, and the trays and the dry ice. I wouldn't do it. But that's one of the that's one of the trade secrets. You do that and your clients coming back next year. One of the most viable things, repeat business. And then everyone that's there as a guest is like, wow got to have that guy. And then also, by the way, if you need a little more money next year for that, you know, they're not going to be sitting there pounding as much on price. They're going to be like, I got to have you. And what do you got for me now? To you, over, over delivering is one of your things. 
Yeah, over delivering is one of the biggest secrets to success. Give them what they're not expecting. It's hard, you know, one of our biggest challenges is, and I think it happens to everyone, you know, it's a lot of work doing what we're doing. And we're not doing as much of this fun creating. We might be doing bookkeeping to some degree. We're doing proposals, we're doing employee management. You gotta like, you gotta get out like your machete and hack through that stuff, man. And you gotta get to the creative stuff. That's for everyone. What's really going to make the difference, you know, whether you're a picnic cater or whether you're a super high end cater, deliver what your client's not expecting. And you're going to create the business that we all want. One that's not as margin or budget focused. They got to have you. That's the sweet spot for all. of and, us. And you've always you've come in wanting to do that from day one. Right. I mean, you have we've had discussions about how you want to sort of position your company and you're positioning it as a proprietary excitement, artistic endeavor. That's right. And that was after being in the business for 10 years where I like ran museums down in Philadelphia and I had long-term contracts. Those are good things. As we all know, I had a fairly sizable company. I'm like, I got to reboot this thing. But it partly is like what resonates with you. Do you know what I mean? Like some people are amazing empire builders and they can get fired up over that. Then do it. But it'll help you build your empire if you got a little bit of that secret creative mojo, you know. But again, giving people what they don't expect and in something that really connects with them, that is very powerful. But you have to pick your customers. You have to pick the people. Your your customers have to really want you and you have to pick them. It's got to be a match at some point, right? Or no? That That is correct. But even if you go to, say, the most conservative we won't name types of industries, but some of the most conservative, you know, want to not be splashy or racy or too innovative. They want to be taken care of. You know, they want that not only those type of clients above all, which they all do, but above all, often they're focused on, is this going to happen because it's heavy duty parties on time, food warm, you know, they're focused on more basics often. But if you can bring to them something again, it's not going to be as experiential. But if you bring if you bring them a level that they're not expecting, I find, and they're certainly guided by budgets often, that all of a sudden that budget boundary isn't so string as rigid as they say. And so again, yes, you've got to you've got to size up your client, where can you go with this? You know, like I'm not bringing shots out for maybe the most conservative ones at a dinner. Yeah, once you read them, you know how to read them and then you take the journey. But you can do something else. And you know what? You got to go out of the box a little bit because it's with everyone. People sometimes in that trying to service the client, they're dumbing it down. So, so give us an example. What's a menu you might give to a more conservative client? And then how do you shake that up for someone who wants something more experiential? So I'll just give you a classic example. So I did a, uh, an event that I would, you know, say was conservative, you know, it was businessman. Uh, it was strictly a business dinner, a couple hundred people. It was in a tent and, you know, you're meeting certain budgets at summer. So we had one station was, you know, a caprese station, make your own caprese. There's a great corporate approach. Everyone loves it. Your cost of ingredients is fairly reasonable. What are you going to do with it? What's going to make it so they hire you the next year? So I've made, which is in my book, Peter Callahan's Party Food is in there. We made um, abstract silhouettes of trees as I envisioned them. And so we had originally done them for a very innovative party over at the Getty Station in Chelsea. Remember when it had grass and the sheet that it was an artist installation? We did a very trippy party there that was covered by Vogue.com. And we did like a food installation. And we had trees hung with uh, caramel apples and you pick the apples off of it. And so then we were like, okay, the tree morphed a little bit more. And those were real live trees. We made our own vision of a modern tree that we cut out of plywood. And that's in my book and it shows it with the apples. But 
for this party that was the corporate one, it was kind of conservative. They were sort of like, well, there's not really a budget for the decorator on this. Got that, right? It's a corporate party. You need to make the space filled up high. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. No pressure there. You know, I'm, I'm the caterer. I thought it just goes in platters, right? No, I'm told, you're told you do, right? Service industry. But I was all of a sudden like, wait a minute. We'll take our apple trees and we'll make them into tomato trees. And I've got my uh, sort of design muse, you know, uh, right-hand person in my office. She said, you can't do that. You can't put tomatoes on. I'm like, yeah, I can. And this is what I, I do come up against it. She's like, it's going to look horrible or you can't do that. I was like, watch me. So then I've got to grab the glue gun. I got to go get those tomatoes. I don't really know if it's going to, if it's gonna, if she's right or I'm wrong, but I got to go somewhere with it. Right. So then I start hanging them and she's like, okay, you're right. And I was lucky. I was right. I'm not always right, but I was right. And so we had tomato trees hanging over it. Right. That was cool. And so all of a sudden it's not just like a caprese thing. It's like a tomato tree. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden these guys and women are taking out their cameras and taking photographs at the buffet you know yeah you know, know you that, got something i don't you know that, that was their intention but you know you're there when that happens <laughs> yeah right? exactly and you get smiles that's that's interesting so that happened by happenstance but um uh are you designing food now differently or planning it differently in response to uh instagram other social media are you designing your food for that specifically now well I'm not designing my food for social media, but I will say that social media has really turned up the heat under all of us because let's just take it from a food guy's point of view. There are all these people and some of them are very successful, the ones that are the best, right? All they're doing is working on their Instagram and they're doing it for three people and they're making great stuff and they're getting millions of followers and everyone's looking at them, including my clients. It's like, Wow, thanks a lot. My competitors used to be how many caters, David? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. But now my now I may not be competing against it, but my clients in their minds are matching me up against the Instagrammers. It's like, okay, so the bar of what you need to do is way raised up. But that's okay. Yeah. Because you know, meet the challenge. And hopefully uh, surpass. Do you think of yourself? You said I'm the caterer and the platter and all that, but you're really a marketer. Well, one person once called me a conceptualist, and I haven't really come up with that word. So I'm all, I'm all ears, guys. Anyone got a better word? You know, uh, Robin's Wolf called themselves event tours. That's not a bad word. Don't know what it means, but it it's more than a caterer, right? And uh, so for myself, you know, we've actually. As we're, we're trying to go through a little rebranding here now, David. And so part of that, everyone's like, lose the word caterer, people, Peter. But then other people are like, well, make sure people know what you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're sort of finding our way through that. Yeah, the but, world you know, is evolving. You know. But is it a problem to be just a caterer these days? Is that not enough? It is totally enough just to be a caterer these days. But it depends on, like, where you're putting yourself in the market, Okay. Catering is just like restaurants. I, you know, there's not really anyone that's doing sort of fast food up to, you know, five star, right? You got to figure out where you want to be in that market and then be there. Ourselves, we're trying to be, you know, up there. I'd love to shift and talk about some food trends right now. Uh, or maybe you don't like the word food trends. I'm not sure. Uh, but maybe we'll talk about how people are eating now. So what changes have you seen in terms well, of- Well, before you get into that, for? I have to, I have to uh, say that the, one of the first events I went to that Peter did was a dinner party that no one sat down. I remember. And, uh, and that was a trend a few years ago. I don't know if it's still a trend, but now go. <laughs> yeah, so that was a trend years ago that people didn't sit down. You know, really sort of the trend- that's going on now is reinvent it all the different components of an event that's what people really want and they just want it not to be at least the people that are coming to us in our sector of the market and this has been going on for a long time but i'm feeling that with the way the world is and all the images that are, that are shared that the bar is way higher and everyone's sort of on this path that is sort of looking to be at the top of the heap. And, you know, there, there's a lot 
you need to be able to do. What does that mean? Go deeper. So, you know, as an example, I invented the donut wall. Well, number one, I even got a design patent on it. Not a utility patent, guys. If I had a utility patent, everyone had to pay me for doing it. With a design patent, everyone can just sort of thumb their nose. I'm not doing exactly like you, Peter. And, you know, that's that's the way the world works. But here's an example. So I came up with that idea. I put it on the Today Show. It was in People Magazine. Everyone's like, okay, now the whole world's doing it, Peter. What else do you have? So that's an example. But that's what people are looking for. Everyone loved the donut wall. Why? It's cool. It's different. It's new. That's what they want. In my new book, you can see a pretzel wall shaped out of a pretzel. You know, now people are going to start doing that because we're sharing it. But that's what people want. And like as an example, they, they really do want, they may not call it an Instagramable moment, but they sometimes do. They're like everyone, like that's one of the most important things at events. Events, you know, if we're talking about corporate events, they're marketing events of one style or another. Even if it's not a marketing event, if it's an employee retention it's all marketing. Or it makes the those staff, say it's an in-house employee thing, feel special. It wasn't just, you know, you do a really nice dinner, you have great hors d'oeuvres, you have great, you know, really nice first course, you serve it well, and it's from a great caterer. That's one experience, right? But if you then take that same group of people and you serve good food, but you show them things that made them smile, got them talking that they haven't seen before, you have a more effective as the host and as the hosting company, you have a more effective event. Maybe it got people talking who don't normally talk to each other. It becomes common ground and it just provides more of a value in the evening. So everyone to a degree wants it, whether they know it or they don't. And once they have it, they know they want it. You know, then the people that are sort of doing something marketing, they absolutely, the big trend, they want experiential. That's the word. It might have been sometimes people use innovative, but experiential. They don't even know really know what it means. You know, they want something that's really out of the box. What does that mean to you? What does that mean? Let, let's okay. What does it mean to you? So experiential to me means that food is presented in a way that it never has been before. So maybe so, an example from your book might be the snowballs, the drink. Snowballs. Let's talk be. about that. Yeah. We're- so the snowballs. And that, by the way, explain that too. So that, that we did uh, every winter an event that was like a winter wonderland. It was a corporate event. It was hosted by a very well known person and like a who's who came to it. And it was a terrific client and is a terrific client because he really just says, run with it. And he wants to know what it is and he gets very excited. Great client. And so it's winter wonderland. And so, you know, one year, all of a sudden, I was like, you know, I'm a skier and I'm around snow. I'm like, we got to do something with snowballs. And I'm like, you know, I know it's totally impractical, but it's okay. As they walk in the front door, we're going to have a tray full of snowballs. It's going to have a drink. You know, it's going to be hand to them. We had to time the whole thing so that how long can they hold in their hand before they're looking to get rid of it? And that's how long <laughs> it takes to drink it. Uh-huh. And the two worked well together because you can't get that big a drink hidden in a snowball. But I mean, it was great. It brings people's smiles to the face. And when they've walked in, these people that have seen everything, they have not had especially a drink that's a snowball. And it's his winter, it's his winter wonderland party. So that's like, that's definitely an experiential thing. And, you know, things can be experiential. It, it's, a, it's a loose word. Right. So we did an event that was for a fundraiser. And again, so my wife, you know, we love walking through the park. And you know that area where there are those guys that, and, and girls that roller skate. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable roller skaters. Well, there's one guy, you see that guy? He wears the balloon pants, never has a shirt on, and he's the best one. He's an incredible skater, great From the guy. 80s, from the 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he can balance stuff on his head, skating like drinks. This guy's amazing. And so my wife's always like, you got to use him at a party. You got to use him at a party. She's absolutely right. So we did a party that was, uh, it was a great party. Ian Schrager did the decor. He had Raul interpret it for him, and it was for a charity. And I mean, you should have seen what they did. And so we're like, right when they go, they transition from cocktails to a, you know, definitely banquet seated dinner. Uh, We were like, and before their auction started, I was like, we got to have roller skaters. And so I've done this party for years. So I had my conference call with, with the ladies who organized this and they're like, well, what are we doing this year? I'm like, we're doing roller skaters, you know? And it's not, it's not an ask. 
it's it's a it's a tell. Have to do it. Because by the way, I don't have three great ideas. I have one, maybe two. That's it. Okay. You know, but hopefully they're good. And you know, the roller skating, like, so we had everyone sit down and we had to leave space between the banquettes and the incredible draping and lights on the side that relative. And then but the guys did laps. These two great looking guys did laps with food, you know, sushi, concession trays, you know, and uh, all in a great sort of uh, Studio 54-ish look, what they might be looking at. Yeah, perfect for Ian like, Traeger. You know, Bianca Jagger <laughs> rode in her white horse. Like we had to play in that room. Yeah, yeah. And I think we got there and it was great, you know, and that to me is an example of a great experiential thing. What have you done? You've done some of the great things for brands too that you've told me about in the past. Uh, just simple, sort of not even fancy brands. I remember that you told me about. Oh, we've uh, done uh, so, some of the interesting ones, Dave, that we've done. So we did one time, you know, those the, these genius guys from South America that went and bought Burger King. They bought the whole company, these young hedge fund guys. And so they hired, you know, uh, Allison Broad to do the PR and they, they really, and, and so they wanted to introduce some, reintroduce Burger King to the luxury press in New York. And so Allison called me up and said, you know, you need to do this, Peter. And so I was like, okay. And it had to be all their ingredients. They even brought in their equipment because it had to be cooked on the same equipment as Burger King uses in their shop. So we were literally, we had trucks running because the event venue doesn't have gas, right? So it was a cool modern building. So we're heating them in our shop and racing down the street in cars and bring hot food up. That's how we did it for, <laughs> for certain ones. And Peter, so, I, I like that example. I was actually at that event. And we um, what I remember about it was the way they marketed that event to the press because they, they said, Peter Callahan and Burger King. It was like you were um, you were top of the marquee, and it was it was kind of intriguing to think. So, how are these styles going to match, or how is 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 Peter going to bring his magic to what Burger King does? Yeah. So we did what we did was we had full size, as you remember, examples of the food down the middle of the tray, and we did great pendants, you know, that were like Burger King, but it looked like Burger King on an Instagram, right? It had like cool branding that they don't do all with their logos, their colors. And then we had mini versions right next to that. So you're just getting a little sample. It was a Burger King sampling, but we did, if I was to reimagine Burger King, we did how it would be and how'd I do? Great, it was a lot of fun too. Ah, so well, there was another product that I remember you telling me about something that you did in your office that you did a wall of product and I forgot what the brand was. So that was that that party was an offshoot because that same hedge fund with Warren Buffett bought Heinz. Right, right, and right. So That's what it was. Were, and they were relaunching mustard. Right. And so everything was about mustard, but in like a cool, hip way. So that was just, you know. How do you make mustard visual on hors d'oeuvres, you know, sort of yellow ballpark? What did they mustard. do? What did they end up? What did you end up doing? So that's easy. So we did like the mini hot dogs. We did, you know, uh, we did, you know, burgers and, you know, uh, you know, we did uh, also, uh, you know, Rubens, just things that are good with mustard, but made the mustard really visible. And then there was a guy that collaborated with us where everything was covered with mustard bottles. Right, right. I so think that's bar, what it was, your whole, so off, your bar, whole venue. The, here's your table. You don't see, your table's made out of mustard bottles. Right, right. That's amazing. Right. And, and same with the trays. Yeah. And decor, uh, playing off the backyard barbecue theme, like Weber Grills, I remember. Yes. Uh, and we feature that on our Instagram feed, and it was one of the most liked pictures of the year. Um, I think it's just creative in those kind of examples that people can recognize the products and, you know, recognize ketchup and mustard and grills from their everyday life, but they're put together in such a way that it makes it special. Do, do, do you think that marketers are underestimating the value of food as one of their tools in their, in their, in their toolbox toolkit? Uh, I mean, they, they're worrying about the branding, they're worrying about everything else, but, but you do it, but a lot of people don't, a lot of the uh, brands don't think about 
catering and food as such a central piece of this. I think you're right that that caterers can do way more than what the big brands know. And they've got to give a little bit of, they've got to give us a little rope. Get involved earlier. They've got it. Yes. They've got to let us get involved earlier and they've got it. And they've got to sort of bring us in the best collaborations. We need to hear what everyone's doing so we can get on the same page. What is the visual? What is the story? What is the brand? And, and then we're just become an extension of that in our way that we interpret. And that's one of my personal greatest strengths. And what's also the most fun is to really understand what a brand is and bring it together in a real visual way. So you look at it and you're like, wow, this is Heinz and this is cool, or this is Burger King. And wow, imagine it this way. And really not to be grandiose, but these brands would go a long way if they started bringing people like myself and other people that have these talents in the industry in to help them because you know, like the way they buy small brands and because they can't incubate them. Well, they also can't really curate their, their product lines because the, the, where they come from, their world, and it's understandable. But what we do could match really well with them. And you know, it's a very interesting thing. April 1st this year, uh, did you see the spoof that McDonald's did? Mm-mm. Tell it, us about it. It was on mini hamburgers which was something that I was the yeah, you're like, guy behind. Yeah, you're like Mr. Miniature and everything I read about yeah. you. Like, so they we'll did talk a whole that. spoof that their head chef in his test kitchen was now making what's going to be their newest offering, mini hamburgers. And they did them really small. And then they got off into their like Willy Wonka world and said, and so of course you have to do it with a mini kitchen and mini utensils. <laughs> and we made all this and they filmed it. And then in tiny, tiny writing on the bottom, they were like, you. I didn't see it like for the first half a day. They said, April Fools, no, we're never doing mini food. We're just kidding. And I would not, well, I, would not. not I would not believe that never. Well, go go into that miniature. I mean, where did you decide? How did you decide the this whole miniature concept? I mean, where did that come from? You know, miniature food came from that I just had one client that said to me, Oh, I want to do uh burgers that are that are that are smaller. And that was the first time that sort of came to me that an everyday food was going to be served at a very, it was a movie premiere, a very fancy party. And so I went out searching for the smallest rolls and they didn't really say what size, but I sort of had in my mind an idea. And when I found what was the smallest commercially available rolls, that's what we used, or maybe our baker tried to do something a little smaller and the client was very happy and it met all the expectations. But that plan of seed, I was like, wait a minute. What if we go really small? And I had to like stalk my kitchen because they're like, we're not making things the size of a quarter. That's not happening. It's too hard and get away from me. (laughs) And uh, so I got them to do it. And when we saw it, I could tell just by seeing it, this is something we're really onto it. Then when we showed it to clients, they freaked out. They were so into it. And I was like, wow, we're onto something. And then I was like off to the races and just trying to dream up classic American things. Cause you know, hors d'oeuvres at that point, if you can remember in the late nineties, that's when I did this. They were, you know, ethnic typically, you know, you do like a Thai chili, lemongrass, shrimp, you know, people were doing fancy trays with seeds in the middle or pumpkin seeds or cinnamon sticks. And they were all very attractive and they were, and that's what the best caters were doing. Me too. And all of a sudden when we, came up with this idea of shrinking. I was like, that's the direction I want to go. And what I loved though was like, and it was just, it wasn't even that conscious of thought, but what I love, like I love stuff like lobster rolls. I like grilled cheese sandwiches. Yeah. I like sugar donuts, like the old fashioned yeah. right out of the yeah. fryer. Everyone and does. I was like, that's what I want to eat. And I was like, but if you shrink them, most of those things in miniature, they look so cool and it makes people happy and smile. And it's just you get this incredible reaction that like food never did before. Food was kind of like a serious thing, or you know, you met the, you know, this is this. You but, have to but your presentation of the miniature stuff also completely enhanced that experience. Yes. Yeah, so we, when we did that, then we were like, wait a minute, we can't have a tray with all these cinnamon sticks and pumpkin seeds because you don't really see the food. Now we really want to see the food. So we started making trays out of acrylic and we were making them ourselves uh, because we didn't know any other way to do it. So we had a shop and we were cutting them and we were making it so that all you saw was the food and the food was the whole look. 
no flowers on the train, no nothing. You don't need anything else because the food becomes the star. How did that change your calculations in terms of how much, how many pieces people would eat per event and what you needed to think about differently because the food the has changed stuff. size? <laughs> the, the interesting thing is I have new chefs come to work for me and I'll tell them, you know, for an hour long cocktail party, if everyone's there during that time, say it's at a wedding, you know, I'll be like, we need, if it's 200 people, we need 2,800 pieces or 14 per every guest. They're like, you're out of your mind. I'm like, watch, because if you make food that looks interesting and then it also has to taste good, they almost want it looks good because I hear this every time. They're like, I don't really expect it to taste good when it looks good. But then you put those two together, you got some hungry guests and you need a lot of food if you're going to have what they're all going to want. And that's something that I hear all the time. You know, if you sort of, it's only logical. If you make something that's not as much they want to eat, like crudite, they're not going to eat you out of house and home or crudite. Yeah, that's for sure. Right? You know <laughs> that's I mean? for sure. You know? <laughs> so when you, the more you drift off into that land, you don't have to worry about your quantities. But you go on a stop that's, oh, like, yeah. that's like that eye candy and then tastes good, they're going to eat. Was that pr- trial and error? How did you figure that out? Oh, it definitely was trial numbers. and error. Mm-hmm. We did a lot more trial and error when we first did all these things. We've gotten a little better about it. Like when I first did cotton candy on a stick, like it would go out and we were doing it. It'd be gone like, in a minute. And it would like, so, <laughs> no, it would slide down the stick. And we're like, you know, trying to figure it out. So now we figure out before we send it out, we do a lot more testing. Or we used to do the little, we did the little glass domes for pheasant or glass would walk out and there wouldn't be sides in the tray and bam, it would smash. And then would look at me like with those dagger in the eyes saying, that tray comes out one more time. I'm going to kill you, Peter. <laughs> so I was like, all right, all right, you know. So we sort of slow down the process a little bit to have it perfect before they come out now. Tell us more about your test kitchen process. What, um, what does that look like? How many? And can we go? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, how many test recipes? What? How many a week, say, or a month are you uh, are you trying out, and how are you judging them? What's the criteria of whether you think something is really going to make it? I think that I partly, you know, there's the there's the fear content, you know, so it's it's going to be, are they going to be happy? Is this going to make the grade? And so you look at you look at it and say. Is it absolutely amazing? You know, so, and then it, does it taste absolutely amazing? And then you say to yourself, if it's something that's really important, like it's going to be your marquee thing, like you need a few marquee things on each event. So your marquee thing is what's really going to grab them. What's really special that you're doing for them. And for those things, it's got to look great. It's got to be a cool idea and it's got to taste good and it's got to be executable. So um, we're coming up with new stuff a lot because a lot of our clients are all repeat. And if they're not, it's still this competitive thing. And so our test kitchen looks like this. We have a machine that takes up three quarters of your room. Got to come down and check it out. (laughs) It's a laser, laser machine. Took me about a year to get it. It was held up in customs because I think they thought it was a weapon because it actually looks like a weapon in the back, you know? And, and so that laser can cut things up to a half inch thick. It can cut food. It can cut uh, acrylic. It can cut wood. It can cut paper and it can do it fast. So we can just make on demand, but these things are hard to operate. Like I had to have, an engineering MBA from a uh, Ivy League, and he was probably the tenth guy I tried out with the dean of the school helping me to get somebody in that could actually run this thing. And it's still a process of discovery, like what we can do with it. And uh, that's part of our test kitchen. We've had uh, Ultimaker is a very well known three D company. So Ultimaker had all these guys in my shop last summer because I got on this whole thing and I've been on it. Like I'm involved in the, in the 3d printing world. And so <clears throat> I made for a party once, you know, for a family that I'd done, they, they got everything. They got all my hottest stuff. 10 years later, they called me for the 50th and they're like, 
what do you got? And so you got to get out of your comfort zone. I'm like, everyone always asks, what haven't you been able to shrink, Peter? What's eluded you? I'm like, chicken wings. <laughs> it's always got to be some Mini common. chicken wings. I'm like, chicken wings. I mean, I really have tried. You made it up. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, we're doing chicken wings for your party. And I had about two weeks to figure that out. And I'm like, we're going to have to make a bone for it. So that's how we got into the... 3D world. So I went to like, you know, a big 3D maker in Brooklyn. And they're like, well, it's going to be about $20 a skewer. And I'm like, <laughs> That's not I need like 400 of those. What's that math? And so then one of my guys that works on fabrication said, well, you can buy a 3D machine for that. He never should have said that. Yeah, yeah. Because I went out and bought one. And then we had to figure out how to run it. And we always had people to come and rescue us. Like there were these great guys in Brooklyn who someone connected me with. And like, you know, they have day jobs. What they really love is 3D. So they came and like all weekend babysat our 3D machine and we printed out the, you know, the chicken bones. And then, and they weren't edible, but they looked like a chicken bone. But then, so, and I got written up in the Wall Street Journal. It's the future of everything for me and 3D because I like sort of stalk the 3D world. And so then I met Ultimaker. I met a girl in Spain and I sort of met everyone. And they're a cool world. And I was like, well, and, the, and, the, and so then people say, well, what are you going to do next then? I'm like, we're going to make this, the chicken bones edible. So I had Ultimaker in, and they would be working for months trying to turn their normal plastics 3D machine with someone else's uh, part to be able to print 3D food. People are printing pancakes. Dylan from Dylan's Candy Bar is printing gummy bears. But no one's printing like everyday stuff. You know, like Hershey's is doing it and they're keeping it under wraps. They said they were going to bring it to market. And I think they've decided they're not going to because they came in with a huge company. So this company really got excited because they love Ultimaker. They want, you know, they're super technical, but they love to see what someone like me is going to do with it. And one day there was a woman there for like a week. And I said to one of my staff, who is she? And they said, oh, she's a baker. Because there's, you know, it's doughs going through. We're trying to bake them. So later on the day, I said to her, oh, so I understand you're a baker. And she's with the other guy from Ultimaker, like a really smart guy. She's like a baker. Peter, I'm a mathematician. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? She's a mathematician. Wow. She's a coder, man. Wow. And that's like cool, like trying to like. So, so she's trying to get, I mean, are you actually 3D printing food in a, in a, right now? We are in the process of doing it. I literally have to like, you know, we have one of the only 3D food printing machines. But it's still in first generation yeah. technology. It hasn't come out to market, but I've got one. You know, so my guy this summer, he's like, well, basically, I'm going to have to write code, oh, you know, to be able to have it print our own things. I'm like, well, of course I want to print my own ideas. <laughs> so the answer is yes, we are able to print food. So your experience with uh, protecting your intellectual property is this a, an area ripe for that and something that, um, you know, other creatives should keep their, their eyes out for? Well, the protecting things is a very interesting thing. And um, it's very challenging to protect uh, a lot of the ideas that we dream up. And we look into it. We have a whole team now that is uh, specializes in this, that are attorneys. And um, if you can dream up stuff that can be protected, maybe it, you know, it creates a whole different type of business. But unfortunately, a lot of the best ideas cannot be. And by the way, when I lecture, like when I lecture, when I do, a, I did a party in India, I'm lecturing in front of a thousand people in Seoul. First question, Mr. Callahan, what protection do you have on your thing? Yeah, because they're just going to knock not, it off. <laughs> not much yet. <laughs> you know? But let's collaborate. How about that? Yeah. But you come up with ideas fast enough where you can't keep up. That's right. So that's kind of the key. That is the key. Yeah. So, Peter, um, as we end this interview, uh, what advice do you give to the person that looks at this party food book and says, oh, my God, I want to be doing that? Well, my advice to the person that looks at this and is not yet doing it is number one, are you passionate enough about the idea of food and events that you're going to be motivated, not by money. You're going to be okay. Redefining the boundaries of hours that you work. 
working nights and weekends when your friends aren't. And on top of it, if the answer is yes, then my next advice would be, and I can still take this advice to myself today and should more on a daily basis, no matter what, fight, create, and make time so that you can do things that are your talent. Whether it's you're an amazing marketer, making your proposals look just spectacular, whether you've got creative ideas with food, how you might want to dress your staff, what you want your trucks to look like, what gifts you might give your clients, how you might want to meet clients and what you're going to talk about and what the experience is going to be like. And really dive deep and make it an enjoyable time. Say, what would be fun? And get into a quiet place and a happy place and think about like, try to dream it. Say, what would be amazing? What would make me happy? What would be my fantasy for what I would serve somebody at their next party or how I would meet them? And then do that and make the time every day to create something that gives you joy and that'll excite you. And then do that, do that and share it with your clients you're going to create an amazing company. Peter, thank you so much for joining us on Gather Geeks. This was a fascinating conversation. And I would just like to end by asking you to tell our listeners how they can reach you, whether on social media uh, or plain old website, any ways that they can reach you. And buy the book. Well, so the way to reach (laughs) us is buy the book, Peter Callahan's Party Food, available everywhere, online, bookstores, and Our email is info at petercallahan.com. And we're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Our website needs a little redoing. That was last redone during our first book in 2011. So Instagram's our most latest up-to-date things, as well as our book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to Peter for joining us on Gather Geeks. David, this conversation took turns I wasn't expecting. (laughs) He is such an interesting person. He is a little exuberant when he talks. He really loves what he does. And is such a creative thinker. And that's what we need in this industry. I think that's what, what makes this industry so interesting and exciting. Absolutely. And before we sign off, I wanted to remind everyone that BizBash Live New York is coming up October 25th at the Javits Center. Also, keep an eye out for BizBash's upcoming fall issue with a focus on the 15 most innovative meetings, as well as a special focus on holiday parties. There are so many great ideas. I can't wait for everyone to see it. It's all on BizBash.com. Great. This is going to be a great issue. It's going to be a great show. This is a great podcast. We hope everybody enjoys it. And what do we say when we end? Gather on. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. Invest in yourself and your staff with self-paced online event education designed to fit into your busy schedule. Subscribe to the Event Leadership Institute for only $25 per month and gain access to an extensive on-demand video library of classes, as well as interviews with industry leaders. Best of all, you can watch classes in small pieces or all at once. For more information, visit eventleadershipinstitute.com.